welcome to the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Trainings Virtual Diplomatic Lunch Discussion. My name is Mark Rincon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an active duty FSO with ADST, and I'll serve today as our moderator. Our mission at ADST is to strengthen public appreciation of U.S. diplomacy and enrich professional knowledge by capturing, preserving, and sharing the experiences of U.S. diplomats. This series features policy experts uh, who contribute to our work via their oral histories and discussions like today's. We invite you to learn more, to support our work, and to sign up to record your own oral history at ADST.org. So during the event today, we will have a Q&A segment. And at any time during the discussion, please type in your questions or comments using the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen through Zoom. We will try to get to as many as possible. So I wanna uh, let everyone know we're pleased to welcome Mark Feldman, who served 16 years as an attorney at the State Department's Legal Advisor's Office from 1965 to 1981, uh, with portfolios covering East Asian affairs, uh, Latin American affairs, and he did have service as a deputy and then as an acting legal advisor during his time with the State Department. His work on foreign expropriations in Latin America at the UN or with the OECD supported US foreign policy to promote economic development through direct foreign investment. And so his recently published oral history available at ADST.org, it provides fascinating insights into the State Department attorney's contributions to foreign policy on a full range of issues. Uh, issues of that day, such as the POW treatment in Vietnam, the return of Iwo Jima to Japan, the James Earl Ray extradition, the Panama Canal treaties, recovery and return of stolen archeological properties, expropriation policy, maritime boundaries, the Iran hostage agreements, and much, much more. And including in that oral history, which it's worth a read, it has interactions with President Richard Nixon and the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, which I'm sure we'll hear about today uh, from his first person experience. So we look forward to that. Today, Mark Feldman is going to be touching on themes of globalism and nationalism through his firsthand experience. And he'd be pleased to take your questions, including on topics where views may differ. Again, use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom. I'm sure we're in for an insightful discussion. So without further ado, welcome, Mark. I'm going to turn it over to you to kick off our discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and the uh, I'm very uh, supportive of the mission of ADST, particularly in this era when we need more and better diplomacy, um, with, given the shocks of uh, recent events. But we're not here to talk about current events. Although globalism and nationalism is a very broad topic, uh, and it has, uh, of course, resonance in our current situation. Um, and I'm hoping when we get to the Q&As, uh, we will have time to connect up the dots, as it were, between history uh, and current events a little bit. Today, though, uh, we're going to take some time travel. I've been asked to speak to my personal experience uh, with issues, um, particularly on foreign expropriations in Latin America in the era of the uh, Nixon-Ford administrations. And to, and to set the scene uh, very briefly, at that time, of course, we had a bipolar world from the point of view of national security. Uh, and we had an intense Cold War, which almost flared to a nuclear war around the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but in that era, probably the United States was the dominant uh, world economic power. Uh, so we, we entered uh, the... Uh, 70s with some confidence about our economic influence, uh, only to be met uh, by um, pushback, um, beginning with uh, expropriation of U.S. investments uh, around the world, but particularly in Latin America, 
to, uh, in, amounting to billions of dollars uh, in countries, just to name a few, uh, Peru, Panama, Chile, Jamaica. Um, and at the same time, there was a, a major enterprise uh, by developing countries to assert their uh, role, their influence in the United Nations. And the North-South Dialogue, as it came to be known, involved a direct uh, challenge uh, to U.S. influence and particularly to the standards of uh, international law and uh, rules-based um, economic uh, relations uh, that were supporting the Reconstruction after World War II uh, and that uh, really uh, contributed enormously uh, to economic development uh, in, the, in the third world. Uh, but these expropriations uh, caused, uh, that not only sh shook the international um, investing environment, but it caused major political problems in America. And as we're going to hear, uh, the inevitable uh, bureaucratic uh, infighting in our, in our own government. Um, so it was a busy time. Uh, for the Foreign Service and for the uh, lawyers working with uh, the Foreign Service. Uh, where do the lawyers come into this? I think it might be useful to uh, remind people that um, it, had, it was from the inception of the Republic, one of the primary responsibilities of the Secretary of State, even in the earliest days uh, of the country, was to protect uh, the interests and the, the lives and interests of U.S. citizens abroad. Um, and as a matter of fact, the I looked into this history at one point. The um, in the first in the 19th century, probably um, the the office of the legal advisor, then known as a solicitor of the Department of State, uh, was was preoccupied. I mean, most of its workload. Uh, involved either management of international claims, or, um, basically the claims of U.S. nationals and sometimes the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis foreign countries, and our boundaries in the era of manifest uh, destiny. Boundaries were a major issue for the Secretary of State and for uh, his lawyers uh, a, a, as well. Um, and I, the other point I think you need to understand is in that era and all the way up to 1976, when we first established um, the Foreign Sovereign, by, by enacting the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976, there were some remedies uh, for claims against foreign nationals uh, for expropriation, limited, but some remedies in the statutory framework, which in other words, there would be a judicial remedy up until that time, the only remedy really as a practical matter for a uh, U.S. company that was, uh, whose property was confiscated abroad uh, was to ask the State Department uh, to uh, espouse that claim, to validate the claim and to take it up as uh, a claim of the United States government uh, against uh, the foreign country. So uh, international claims were a core uh, role for the uh, legal advisor's office. Uh, and it's not surprising, I think, that when we were confronted in the 70s with so many foreign, and 60s, with so many foreign expropriations that uh, the lawyers were called upon to do their part in the diploma, di diplomacy that was necessary uh, to, move, to move ahead. Um, now, when I, I, I think I'll begin by telling a, a couple of war stories uh, that are actually not in my oral history. And, and I should stop now and say, I'm, I, want, I meant to say at the very outset that I'm grateful for to ADST for hosting uh, my oral history and particularly uh, to Robin Matthewman, uh, who conducted those interviews. And I think uh, I would expect that the uh, material that it, I have written down and after careful thought is probably going to be more reliable than some of my extemporaneous uh, remarks today. If any of what we talk about today interests you, I would encourage you 
to go to the uh, text of the, of the oral uh, history. But to, to revert uh, to some stories that uh, are not in the history, it will show you how I came to understand the dimensions of the problem facing the United States and the legal advisor's office in uh, this area. Uh, I became assistant legal advisor for, uh, for the bureau then called uh, American Republic Affairs uh, in the fall, of September 1968. So we're in the last days of the Johnson administration. Uh, President Richard Nixon won the election in November and assumed office uh, in uh, January of uh, 1969. So my first encounter with a, a foreign expropriation and an international claim issue uh, was in the context of the Johnson administration. Covey Oliver, a very distinguished academic and uh, diplomat, was the assistant secretary. And I was invited to a meeting in his office uh, where one of our very large utilities was the, had asked for a hearing for, for an interview. And, and their story was this. They had been expropriated uh, by the government of Colombia and paid no compensation, as best I recall. And they had been fortunate to uh, either to have a negotiate. I don't know whether it was a pre-existing contract or a special arrangement, but they had managed to uh, organize an arbitration, an impartial international arbitration of their claim. And they won that claim. Uh, and what I remember vividly because it came as such a shock to me, uh, was that the arbitrator, a very distinguished Colombian jurist by the name of Saint-Père, uh, had been prosecuted and imprisoned uh, by the government for wrongful uh, decision. Uh, for I guess they, they called it willful wrongful decision in awarding compensation to this utility. Uh, I didn't realize that that was uh, possible, and I certainly didn't appreciate how close to the norm it was um, uh, in in trying to in terms of the difficulty of trying to solve these problems. And then I found um, the uh, other lawyers, the younger lawyers in the office, warned me uh, that one of the things that I would have to do on a daily basis in what we called LARA, that is the Office of the Assistant Legal Advisor for American Republic Affairs, was to handle the uh, phone calls of disappointed American citizens who had been referred by the Foreign Service, by the State Department, uh, to the courts of the foreign country expropriating their property. And invariably, those judicial remedies abroad uh, failed. Uh, and then they would turn to the State Department and ask for espousal of claim. And I mean, and, and this, this practice of the State Department was rooted in sound legal theory, uh, the, the notion being that uh, in principle, uh, you, uh, claimants like with a uh, claim against a foreign government should exhaust uh, available uh, effective local remedies in the host country before asking uh, for a diplomatic solution uh, by the United States government. But it never worked in our experience. Uh, and every day, uh, I, there were two or three people who would call the office every single day and tell whoever would listen their sad stories about how um, they had not achieved any uh, compensation or recognition of their claims in the foreign courts in Latin America. Over time, I came to believe uh, that it was not possible uh, as a practical matter uh, uh, in most countries of the world uh, for a court to, uh, to act independently of its government in a matter of um, extreme uh, sensitivity politically, touching on the sovereignty of the country and its national and its, its, its national pride uh, and its 
relations with the powerhouse United States of America. So for uh, a number of years, at my initiative and at the initiative of some of my superiors, uh, the Office of Legal Advisor declined uh, to refer claimants uh, to uh, the local remedies in foreign countries. One of my complaints about the State Department today is that there is no uh, memory uh, of those days. And I, I see that mistake sometimes being uh, repeated. But let's go back to uh, my, uh, you might, might call it the sentimental education of the young Mark Feldman uh, in the State Department. When, when I uh, came to LARA in 1968, we, uh, there had been a lot of work done by my predecessors, both foreign service and uh, legal, uh, resolving most disputes, uh, bilateral disputes in the hemisphere. And we expected quiet. Well, quiet we did not receive. I had uh, been in the office just two or three weeks uh, when there was a coup in Peru on October 3, 1968, in which the Bella Undi government was overthrown by a military junta uh, led by General Juan Velasco Alvadaro. Uh, and one of the first things they did uh, was to repudiate an agreement that had been negotiated um, relating to uh, a long-standing dispute over certain oil fields in Peru uh, operated by the owned and operated by the International Petroleum Company, um, a subsidiary uh, of Exxon. Um, so uh, the this was very nationalistic, left-leaning, uh, government um, with no interest in uh, de democratic norms. Uh, it was, I think, probably the, some of its actions uh, were popular. Um, uh, the uh, settlement, there had been a long-standing history uh, of controversy over uh, these Exxon uh, uh, operations in Peru. Uh, and I think the Confiscation of those uh, without compensation of the oil fields was popular in Peru, and it was a uh, very serious challenge uh, to to uh, the rule of law and to United States interests in that part of the world. A few days later, there was a coup in Panama, and the government of uh, President Arias, which had just finished negotiating some uh, treaties with the United States about the Panama Canal, was over thrown by another military coup, the national leader of the National Guard, uh, General Omar Torrios, um, over, uh, mounted a coup and took over um, uh, the government of Panama. Uh, and he was a powerhouse down there for years. He repudiated, not only repudiated those uh, negotiations uh, about uh, respecting the uh, long festering issues related to the Panama Canal Zone, but he also expropriated a lot of uh, American-owned uh, property. Um, and just two years later, uh, many of you will know, uh, Salvador Allende's government was, uh, 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 Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile in September 1970, uh, bringing to power there uh, um, a militant anti-American pro-Castro government, and there's a lot we will be talking about that as we uh, as we pursue this. That's a, a very controversial episode in um, the history of our uh, of our hemisphere. Um, let me start, um, if I may, with the IPC case uh, because that was one of the most dramatic uh, and uh, personal experiences I had in the United States government, culminating in a, a meeting, a long meeting uh, with President Richard Nixon on Easter Sunday, uh, 1969, uh, with just uh, three persons present, and he spent most of the most of the holiday morning after church with us, uh, trying to figure out what to do about uh, this expropriation. And the, when President Nixon became, well, Richard Nixon became president on January 20th, 
of 1969, he was facing a deadline only three months away, uh, driven by a statute called the Hickenlooper Amendment, uh, which required uh, the United States government to suspend all foreign aid to any country that had expropriated American property uh, and had not taken appropriate steps within six months to discharge its uh, obligations to that company under international law, including particularly the payment of full compensation, uh, what we called it roughly uh, just compensation. There's a lot of legalities behind that, uh, but we'll postpone that for the moment. So Richard Nixon comes into office with a pro-business uh, constituency uh, and runs the risk uh, of having his very first uh, measures in uh, on the world scene um, cause a, a confrontation that would remind people uh, of U.S. dollar diplomacy. Uh, I should say that in Peru, everything that I heard at the time, the regime there expected uh, a strong um, uh, response by the United States, not just in legal terms, but they expected a, a counter coup to be mounted uh, by the United States. And even uh, if, if I have this correct, uh, required the re recall of uh, the head of the CIA mission. And they, there was a lot of um, gossip. I don't know that it was any of it was well-founded that we were organizing a coup uh, in Peru. Um, but the mission, it, the Nixon administration was very cautious about this. And they decided uh, that they need to be very proactive. And they appointed a man named John Irwin uh, to be as a special ambassador uh, to travel to Peru and to negotiate this uh, controversy face-to-face uh, -face with General uh, Velasco. And I was privileged to be the lawyer on that team. And um, the desk officer and I and the ambassador uh, took a White House plane uh, to Lima in March. And we spent, uh, I don't know exactly, maybe about 10 days there in some very uh, tense uh, negotiations uh, in a very weird uh, situation. Uh, the uh, the generals uh, were extremely nervous. They were they did not love the United States. Uh, they were fearful uh, that we were going to mount a coup, and their anxiety and hostility uh, was made manifest when instead of allowing us uh, to come into the city and have accommodations in the normal course, they isolated us the first few nights in a villa in a remote location that was isolated from, we were completely cut off from any contact uh, with, with uh, the government or uh, any other constituencies, not to mention the, the media. And there, it was quite clear that they, they had uh, plainclothes people around uh, making sure that we didn't leave that property. Um, and we spent, I think, two or three nights there before they relaxed uh, and allowed us to move into the quarters, if I recall correctly, in the uh, residence of the ambassador. Uh, but this was a very strained environment. And one uh, thing that I would uh, mention uh, is that uh, the, the first morning I got up and took a little break and walked around the property uh, under the observation of these guards, uh, I noticed uh, a European uh, gentleman in a white linen suit and Panama hat. And to, to my uh, eye, uh, without any foundation for this, I, I just sort of reacted. That guy looked as if he could be a, German, a Nazi war criminal refugee in Latin America, of which there were uh, many, many uh, at the time. I don't have time to go into it right now, but later, if you read my oral history, you'll see that later on, uh, I learned that that person was Klaus Barbie, the famous or infamous butcher of Leon, um, 
uh, who was eventually repatriated by the French, prosecuted, uh, and uh, died in prison. Um, uh, and he, he never was uh, showed any remorse uh, whatsoever. Anyway, to continue with IPC, uh, and Mark, I can see this is taking me longer uh, than I expected, so you'll have to keep me, uh, me uh, on schedule. The, um, the long and the short of this is uh, that after the negotiations were futile, it was hopeless to try to get any uh, arrangement, meaningful uh, arrangement with Peru, and the Nixon administration had to bite the bullet. Uh, and uh, we found a fig leaf uh, with, that permitted the administration to take the position uh, that there was still pending an administrative uh, process um, that would um, permit us to defer formal uh, suspension of aid to Peru for another interval. Uh, and so, the, but John Irwin was eager uh, to talk to the president directly to make sure he was going to be happy about this. So we we flew back uh, for a weekend visit over Easter, um, again in uh, White House transportation. Um, and after meeting, he met with Secretary William Rogers and uh, other cabinet people. The decision was made. And then we went to Key Biscayne um, to meet with President Nixon personally. Uh, we just traveled in a White House jet star. It was pretty exciting for me to travel in a presidential plane. Uh, then we took a presidential hel helicopter to Key Biscayne. Uh, and I was there with John Irwin and Ernie Syracuse, who was the DCM in Lima. We spent most of the morning with President Nixon. And that my takeaway, as I uh, recall in my oral history uh, on, on that occasion, was Nixon's musing about the problem that he had, that the Eisenhower administration had when Nixon was vice president in Egypt. When Nasser asked the United States, he, he was talking to us, re recalling this experience, uh, he told us, uh, that when Nasser asked for United States assistance uh, to build the Aswan Dam in Egypt, John Foster Dulles opposed that uh, effort, and Eisenhower accepted uh, Dulles's recommendation. And the response in Egypt was for Nasser to bring in the uh, the Soviets uh, as a military ally. Uh, they had agreed uh, to fund the construction of the Aswan Dam. And he told us that he would, did not want, uh, want to have uh, repeat an experience like that uh, in uh, Latin America over an aid issue. And uh, let's, we don't have time this morning to dwell into uh, in the legalities of, of that decision. Uh, I will say that um, uh, we all recognize that the statutory interpretation was thin. It served a larger foreign policy purpose. And as an attorney, I took some comfort in the fact that de facto aid had been suspended. So you couldn't say that there was outright law breaking uh, by the Nixon administration. Uh, but in those days, when you had an international expropriation, you would have uh, congressional and business pressure to exercise coercive diplomacy of that character, and it was built into our national uh, legislation. And this decision uh, not to formally, openly uh, apply the Hickenlooper Amendment drew a great deal of criticism. And the ultimately, as uh, I'll tell you as we go on to Chile, uh, the State Department won the battle but lost the war because when Allende took office uh, and uh, confiscated the copper mines and uh, I guess generally all American investment of any significance in Chile, the, um, the pressure on the White House was enormous 
and, uh, we, uh, and as the secretary, the very powerful, dynamic secretary of the treasury at the time, John Connolly, uh, led a, a kind of a push. And, and Kissinger talks about this a bit in his memoirs, years uh, of upheaval. Uh, and the result was that uh, Nixon uh, issued a, a formal um, memorandum uh, in 1972. I, let me just get the date on this because this is a very significant event. January 19, uh, 1972. Um, which said, uh, after reviewing our expropriation policy, and I think we had about 51 cases out in uh, the world, mostly in Latin America, but other continents as well, of unsettled expropriation came. But he, the policy the, the, uh, was to say that there would be a presumption going forward in the event of any uh, uncompensated taking um, that the um, United States would veto um, lending in by any in, uh, in international financial institution. It, but it wasn't just a policy statement. It was also a reorganization of the bureaucracy. Uh, the, it, 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 the State Department was, had been the lead agency. It was going to be replaced by a committee in the White House. Uh, on the economic side, under the leadership of Pete Peterson, who was Henry Kissinger's uh, counterpart for international economic affairs. And it was a committee, an interagency committee that would, where Treasury would have a tremendous influence uh, in the White House. Um, the good part of it, from my point of view, was that they also, they also uh, created a full-time new office in the Economic Bureau at the State Department staffed by an FSO, some very talented people, and I was their lawyer. Uh, so we were, you know, we, we were still active in all of this, but it was in an environment um, where uh, people could say with some justification that uh, the policy of, a, of, of a conciliation, I don't want to say appeasement, had been rejected, um, at least uh, on, on, on the surface of things. Um, but given that the, the, uh, the uh, where we are in time here, I want to say a few words about um, Chile, uh, where there was also uh, some, I had some involvement um, on the expropriation issue. The uh, the I will say, that, and Henry Kissinger, uh, of course, as uh, Nixon's uh, national security advisor, was deeply involved. Uh, much has been written about that. Um, the election of, of Allende uh, was, came as a great shock in Washington. Um, he, was, he only had about 37% of the vote, um, and, but it was sufficient. Uh, he had the plurality uh, in a constitutional structure uh, in, a, in the context of a political dynamic where he was able to organize the government uh, and I must say that uh, the White House seemed to be surprised by this, and they blamed that surprise on the State Department. Um, my friend and uh, Ed, Ed Corey was the ambassador to Chile at the time. Uh, I think he was an outstanding Foreign Service officer uh, uh, who had had you know wonderful success in Ethiopia and then in. Chile and the, working with the uh, government of Eduardo Frey on copper issues, but he, uh, he became the fall guy uh, for this, and uh, he, it ruined his career, and he knew it. Uh, he came back to Washington. The election was on was in September, maybe the first of September, nineteen seventy. Um, he came back to Washington for consultations, and Ed Corey was a very dynamic guy. Uh, he decided that what he wanted to do was to, to go back and to, uh, to, to Santiago and try to pre-negotiate uh, a settlement of the copper uh, uh, confiscations. Chileans, Allende had made it clear that his first act in office would be to um, confiscate without confiscation 
the, the major copper mines in, in uh, Chile, which were the property of American investors there. Um, and Corey thought we, he wanted to open a dialogue on that issue uh, with the Allende uh, administration before he was actually inaugurated on October, I think it was 27th. I mean, I'm, maybe it was the 1st of November, but anyway, the, the date escapes me a little bit uh, at, at the moment. But we, so he asked, since I had a, was working expropriation issues for the Bureau at that time, he asked me to travel to Santiago, to fly to Santiago with him. I think we flew on October 24th or, or 25th. Um, and what I remember this vividly because uh, we arrived uh, on a rainy, windy morning in the airport in Santiago. I'd never been there before. And we're greeted by a huge crowd of uh, media uh, on the wet pavement of the airport. Turned out that the foreign minister of Chile, uh, Valdez, was on the plane uh, and came off the plane. But more striking to me was the headline in the uh, local papers uh, that the uh, chief or the, certainly the uh, prominent, uh, most prominent general in the Chilean military had been shot. Uh, and General uh, Rene Schneider, if I remember the, the names correctly. And that was not a very auspicious uh, happening to start this mission uh, that Ambassador Corey uh, had, had initiated. Uh, of course, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of accusations uh, that somehow the CIA had had a hand in that or had some contact with those people. Turned out to have been a kidnapping went bad by Chileans. Uh, I have no expertise, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it to the historians to deal with whether there was any U.S. contact at all there. Um, but whatever it was, it was a mess. Um, and uh, I had one assignment from Ambassador Corey on that trip, uh, which was to have a lunch the, that day uh, with a, a, a colleague or an advisor to Allende, who was an expert in financial matters. I had that nice lunch. And um, my brief, I thought, was to um, encourage him uh, to have a constructive uh, dialogue with the United States uh, about uh, compensating uh, the, the copper companies and other U.S. investors and suggesting that that might be a way of establishing some kind of uh, receptivity for a relationship in Washington. When I got back to the embassy after lunch, I, was, uh, I found that Ambassador Corey was really in shock, I think, uh, he had been told by the White House, specifically by by the National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, that this meeting, that this uh, negotiation, this mission was not authorized, and we should stop what we were doing and immediately return uh, to Washington. Um, well, uh, that's what happened. Um, uh, the long and short of this is that. Um, down the road, we did finally get into some secret negotiations with Allende, uh, but that, by that time, relations, uh, his situation in Chile uh, had deteriorated. Uh, there were strikes everywhere. All kind of, his public support was fading, and and uh, not by the time we met um, under cover of an OAS meeting in Lima. Um, maybe June of 1970, by September, there was this military coup uh, in uh, the Pinochet regime overthrew uh, the uh, Allende regime. Uh, so those negotiations were aborted. I would just say that the proposal that the United States floated uh, in those negotiations uh, was the familiar theme of international arbitration. There was a 1914 Treaty of Conciliation, uh, which provided for fact-finding and non-binding um, recommendations. We, we converted that in 
we, we, we invoked that treaty and, and recommended to them, proposed to the, to the Chilean uh, interlocutors, who, by the way, in this secret meeting in Lima, these were cabinet level people. I sat there with, um, as part of the team, uh, led by Jack Kubish, then Assistant Secretary of State, uh, opposite uh, Ambassador Latelier, who was later murdered in Washington. Uh, Toha was the Secretary, was the Interior Minister uh, in Saigon, and and in not as a, in Santiago, uh, and he was also murdered uh, in in the course of the Pinochet uh, coup. Um, so th these were serious and dramatic and good faith efforts to find a solution uh, to these expropriation matters. We proposed binding arbitration. They might have gone for the conciliation, but they were not ready to accept uh, binding arbitration. So um, anyway, that's that was um, at, at that stage, Henry Kissinger was still in the White House as national security advisor, and we had never met, although I had worked on uh, many matters that came uh, to his desk. Uh, but I'm going to have a little drink of water at this moment before shifting gears here to the to the time when Henry Kissinger became Secretary of State. Well, that that's a uh, timely uh, mark for. Uh, I'm I'm jumping in here. I know we have uh, colleagues who are going to be um, asking a few questions uh, using the Q and A function. Uh, uh, one had come in earlier about. Could you characterize a little bit uh, your your relationship, the interactions with Henry Kissinger? I understand that's a very interesting uh, uh, kind of back and forth that you had. If you could just uh, go into that a little bit, and uh, we'll get to some of the questions from the others, please. All right, let's 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 do that. Um, well, the story. Uh, most of my family and close friends not that interested in what I did in the State Department, but they're very amused by this uh, story that when uh, Henry Kissinger became Secretary of State, I think it was in September 1973, and he briefly held, well, for a period of months, he held a dual position uh, of uh, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. Uh, he turned his, he was um, still suffering the ill effects of the Chile experience, uh, and he turned his attention to Latin America, and he decided to organize a, a new dialogue uh, with in the hemisphere. And he wanted to, he, he decided and did bypass the traditional OAS mechanism and uh, organized with the help of um, uh, Oscar Rabasa, Oscar Rabasa, the foreign minister of Mexico, uh, Me Emilio Rabasa, the uh, Oscar Rabasa was his father, uh, a lawyer in Mexico that I negotiated with. Emilio Rabasa was the, uh, uh, the foreign minister of Mexico, and they and he organized a meeting in Mexico and uh, uh, of all the foreign ministers of Latin America, and he had asked for some briefing papers uh, uh, from all the interested players. Um, and we in the legal advisor's office prepared, since he, his interest obviously included issues of expropriation, which, which uh, ne next to Cuba and Panama, the Canal Zone, uh, were the, you know, probably the most um, inflammatory issues on the agenda in the hemisphere. And, the, and we wrote a package, uh, basically... Um, describing the impasse uh, between uh, the U.S. view and the Latin American view, which was both bilateral and which was uh, uh, also the subject of uh, major differences in U.N. deliberations. Um, the president of uh, the new president of Mexico, after all, Luis Echeverria, had introduced um, a, uh, a program uh, uh, proposed that the UN adopt, and it eventually did adopt, uh, a charter on the economic rights and duties of states that uh, was counter to US traditional positions on many issues, but including 
that uh, that countries who expropriate property ought to pay uh, just compensation for it. And I listened to it. Um, I think I was at, at that time before before Carlisle Maw uh, came in as. Uh, Kissinger's uh, personal lawyer, now legal advisor uh, of the State Department. Uh, my machine is telling me my internet is unstable. I hope uh, you can hear me uh, out there. Anyway, uh, Kissinger outlined his program and he didn't even mention the issue of uh, expropriation. Uh, I wasn't sure he had read our papers, uh, but he certainly wasn't he wasn't even going to mention or address uh, concerns that we had. Um, and I guess I said something inappropriate. Uh, I hadn't met him before. Uh, and I later regretted it, but I, I think I said something along the lines that this was an impossible dream, that this was a trap. Nothing, nothing good could come out of this. And dealing with trying to deal with expropriation on a multilateral basis, with uh, where everybody else in the room was on the was that Carlisle Ma arrived on the scene, had a nice apartment in the Watergate, and he invited a few of his lawyers to uh, meet the secretary after hours in that apartment. And as he introduced me to Henry Kissinger. Uh, the secretary said to Carl, I know him. He's the guy who gives everybody a rough time. And, and Carl Moore said, uh, well, he's an attorney. That's his job. And the secretary said, well, he's doing it very well. Uh, so that's, uh, I, did, I got off on the wrong foot. Uh, but I'm sorry to say, because I take no satisfaction in it, that the conference at Tlava Loco uh, did not go well. And from Henry Kissinger's point of view, it was a disaster. Uh, what I learned, because I don't think I was invited to uh, participate in the run-up to that, um, I learned secondhand and, uh, that Henry Kissinger had really intended and, and tried um, I'm reading back in now, having looked at this again uh, in preparation for, for the oral history. He all along it was his intention to trade the U.S. the whole Western legal position on state responsibility for expropriated property for other um, political understandings uh, with Latin America. Uh, I don't know exactly what he hoped to get uh, for that. But I was told, I think authoritatively, that Carl Maul, the legal advisor, who was, had been in private life, Henry Kissinger's personal lawyer, was asked to and tried. He proposed to the Mexicans a change. He was trying to reach a compromise, uh, which is very diplomatic, sensible, real, real, you know, from a realist point of view, uh, for, from a point of view of uh, everybody but the investors, a very... Uh, a sensible thing to do. He was trying to reach a compromise and it said to, to get the Mexicans to, to sell to the rest of the Latins a, a new formula for the standard of compensation, which would be fair compensation, uh, not the compensation to which a party might be entitled as a matter of law, but fair. Uh, and that would have been regarded by the whole Western coalition and the UN as a, as a betrayal and of course, by uh, our American business community, not to mention the Treasury and so on. Uh, and But the thing was that the Mexicans wouldn't accept it. Now, I have no idea. I'd love to know. There are people around still living who know, I guess, what the, what the bargain was that Henry Kissinger was proposing to, uh, uh, to Rabasa, but it was rejected. Uh, their position was even more rigid than the legal advisors, uh, the office's uh, position. But this wasn't the end of that controversy. And I think I, I, it's in my oral history, and I should tell you that, uh, that this didn't stop. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Stephen Schwabel, who at the time was a deputy legal advisor who represented the United States 
in those international uh, negotiations um, relating to the Charter of Economic uh, uh, Rights and Duties of States told me that he, uh, uh, that, and by the way, that was a, a, a resolution which was opposed by all like-minded countries in the UN, but it was adopted by a overwhelming vote since that's where the votes are in the UN. Uh, but some of our firm allies said no, and a few of them said abstain. And, and what Steve Schwebel told me, and I published this in my oral history with his consent, and Steve is a very significant guy. He became uh, president of the International Court of Justice. Um, he, he somehow found out that he, at the instance of the Mexicans, again, the Mexican foreign minister, Emilio Rabasa, uh, that in the final vote on the charter, uh, Rabasa called Kissinger and asked him if he would please abstain rather than voting no. And Steve was so upset about that. And of course, L, or at least Steve wasn't consulted. Um, and of course, I was not consulted, but I wasn't in the chain of command on that particular multilateral issue. So Steve, as I report in my oral history, called the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Charles Percy. Uh, and Percy called Kissinger and talked him down. I can't imagine that secretary was very happy about that. Um, so the United States ended up voting no along with the colleagues that we had promised. I mean, Steve had spent a lot of time um, organizing no votes um, as a kind of a common front. Uh, so I, I would imagine that Secretary Kissinger come, came away from this experience uh, thinking that lawyers could be more of a problem than an aid uh, in some of his enterprises. Uh, I regret that, uh, but it's a true part of the story. Well, and uh, <clears throat> that's interesting you you mentioned that because, I mean, even we have a, a lot of Foreign Service colleagues uh, on the line here who sometimes in internally interactions with the legal advisor is, uh, or with that office, sometimes it's seen as, you know, an impediment or something that might slow down clearances. But it's it's clear from your experience and, and the background you share in the oral history that uh, it isn't just... Uh, it's not really an impediment, but it's re you really have to consider every little detail uh, on, on, on any communique, on any kind of treaty. And so I, I wanted to follow up. We have a question that came in, uh, and I think it's related to diplomacy and diplomacy, especially within Latin America. Uh, and it's rather forward looking. So if, if Secretary Austin's going to Brazil for the conference, of defense ministers of the Americas, uh, what advice you know would you provide in terms of? Uh, you mentioned there were secret negotiations that, with your experience with Kissinger, sometimes in Latin America there there's a, a delicate diplomatic dance. Forward looking, what what advice would you give to you know officials going to to not just Brazil but in Latin America? Are there things that that stand out for you and how to be effective? Well, I don't think I'm well placed to advise uh, the Secretary of Defense on anything. Uh, and Latin America is not the Latin America that we worked with. You know, we're talking ancient history here. Um, and there's a problem that the United States has a lot of uh, repair work to do at home uh, before uh, it can preach uh, unity uh, abroad. As I look over the the scene, you know, from the outside, like anybody who's listening in, who's not serving uh, on the payroll right now, I see uh, a very sad landscape in Latin America. the The issues that we are facing uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, are enormous, uh, and they're part of a much broader global framework uh, where climate change, immigration, displacement of people, drought, fires, e economic destruction of agriculture, I mean, climate destruction of agriculture, 
dissolution of democracy. You look at what's happened in Venezuela and Brazil, um, and you look at what's happened, uh, some of the near misses we've had in this country is a very pessimistic um, uh, outlook. Uh, look, in my day, uh, you would advise the Secretary of Defense uh, to be careful not to project dollar diplomacy and, uh, because the United States carried a lot of baggage. Uh, some of that, there is still some of that, uh, I suppose, in our reputation in Latin America, which impairs collective action. But there's so many bad actors south of the border now in positions of power. It's a minefield. I don't envy any administration uh, faced with those problems. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. There's, uh, I think we have time for uh, another question here that came in from a, a professor. Do you regret the role you played in Chilean politics that led to the overthrow of President Allende and Pinochet's tenure, which led to the human rights issue in Latin America, abuses and so forth? Uh, uh, absolutely not. And uh, nothing that I did led to the overthrow of President Allende. Um, and uh, let me just talk about what I did. I was involved in negotiations to solve a problem. Uh, and the mandate that Corey gave us on that was to try to do it before he ended, even took power so that we would, uh, we would have commonality of economic interests that might be sufficient leverage uh, to avoid uh, a very negative response uh, in the Nixon White House. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, on, the, uh, on the larger question, uh, of whether there was any U.S. responsibility uh, for the Pinochet coup, uh, I can I, I believe that John Crimmins, who uh, gave his oral history on this subject, uh, is correct, and it's reflected in Henry. I would recommend that anyone who wants, to, who's got an open mind, read uh, Henry Kissinger's chapter uh, on Chile in the uh, his book, The Upheaval years of upheaval. Uh, as far as I know, and I believe it to be accurate, the only involvement uh, of the U.S. in the time frame we're talking about that is leading up to the Pinochet coup was a few million dollars of aid uh, to um, the media and other uh, uh, centers of independent opinion um, in maybe political parties, I'm not sure of the details, uh, in, in Chile. Uh, what, what it, uh, some people who research this can, uh, or read the paper conflate the White House reaction to the election of Allende in uh, 1970, where uh, I, I think they called, there was a, a reaction we didn't do very much to oppose Allende, and that was part of the problem. What Nixon White House thought we should have done a lot more, uh, be more proactive in the election. Uh, and apparently, uh, it, the Kissinger's uh, recall of Corey on the mission where I was with him for 48 hours was connected to a White House decision which I've seen referenced as Plan B, which was an off the book CIA effort to do something to prevent the inauguration through the political process because 67% uh, of the uh, voters of uh, Chile voted against Allende. And my impression is that the worst thing that they did was to let the CIA talk to some of these uh, people involved in uh, the Schneider kidnapping attempt, which went bad. But I don't have any firsthand information on that. Uh, but I take it uh, on uh, from John Crimmins, and not just from Henry Christinger, but from John Crimmins, whom I trusted, uh, that we had no involvement uh, in the coup. Uh, we were trying to finance with a minimum amount of money uh, independent newspapers and other sources. Great. I guess yeah, I think um, what Kissinger writes and again, I have no firsthand knowledge of this, is that money was appropriated. Uh, I think Nat Davis was the ambassador to Santiago at the time. 
and he was authorized uh, to to give to take some funds and provide it to the trade unions who were on strike at the time of bringing down the, the the whole regime. There's a whole cycle of repression and protest and repression that brought down the regime. Um, and Nat Davis, according to Kissinger's account, did not spend that money, and the CIA was unhappy about that. So I, 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 it isn't a question Mark felt, and I have no guilt uh, and no regrets. Uh, but uh, I don't think the United States government did anything untoward. I, t I describe in some detail in my oral history the how I was investigated by the Justice Department uh, when they were considering charging my client, the Assistant Secretary of State. Charlie Meyer of, for perjury in connection with the church subcommittee hearings on the Allende election in uh, in Chile. Uh, and I, I recommend that reading uh, to uh, your professor who asked this question. Uh, and the short answer is John Crimmins, who was my client um, and I and mentor really on I just uh, owe him a lot to John Crimmins uh, for introducing me to the ways of diplomacy. As I there you go. told the no, Justice no, I Department, as I told the Justice Department investigators, John Crimmins gave us instructions. No one's going to lie uh, in response to these congressional inquiries, and that was our stance at that time. Well, I want to thank you, Mark. I see the time we've we've reached a limit, but I do want to encourage people to uh, in the chat. I I put the link to the oral history. Uh, his oral history can also be found at adst.org. I encourage you to to give it a read and and the other oral histories and resources that we have. Mark Feldman, really, I want to thank you uh, sincerely for. Uh, taking the time and, and presenting with us today. And just a reminder to everyone else that this discussion, the recording will be available uh, in the coming weeks. And we usually put those on ADST's YouTube channel. So visit ADST.org for those videos and for other resources. And I'd like to thank everyone for your uh, joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we'd welcome uh, continued support and uh, visiting our website and, and uh, spreading the word uh, for anyone who's uh, hungry for a, a dose of history uh, monthly or, or, or beyond. So we look forward to your participation at other events. I'd like to thank you again. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to all of those who uh, joined us. This event officially is now over. Uh, in keeping with our tradition, uh, you're welcome to, to stay on and, and chat as time and availability permits, but the uh, recording will be stopped. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And um, I just wanted to say for anybody who wants more of this material, the uh, Washington Foreign Law Society is posting this week two podcasts that I made with your interviewer, Robin Matthewman, uh, 